Copyright University of Auckland, all rights reserved. The content and delivery of lectures in this course are protected by copyright. Material belonging to others may have been used in these lectures and copied by and solely for the educational purposes of the university under licence. You may record the lectures for the purposes of private study or research, but you may not sell, alter or further reproduce or distribute any part of these lectures to any other person. Failure to comply with the terms of this warning may expose you to legal action for copyright infringement by the copyright owner and or disciplinary action by the university. Sweet. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Edwin, and I'll be showing you how to get Microsoft Imagine. So Microsoft Imagine is, is basically some free resources that Microsoft gives students exclu exclusively. So it's kind of like how Microsoft gives students like Office 365 as well, except Microsoft Imagine is more focused towards like developers and just writing your own software. So to start off, um, you guys can follow along as well. So even if you don't have your laptops, just do it on your mobile phone. Um, so first of all, what you want to do is you want to go to imagine.microsoft.com. And before you do this as well, uh, make sure you have a Microsoft email address, so something like an Outlook or a Hotmail or something along those lines. So after you do this, uh, you see on the top right here, there's a sign in button. Yeah. The network. Okay. <laughs> if, if, you, if you can, try and tether to like a mobile or something, but yeah. At the moment, uh, we can't really get the credentials if, if they don't work for you, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, so on the top right here, you'll see sign in. So just click on that, and um, it'll just ask you to sign in with your Microsoft email address. So... All right, so, so if any time you guys feel like I'm going too fast, just put your hand up and tell me to slow down, and then we can wait. Yeah, so after you've signed in, um, this is the page you should be looking at. And um, over here, you'll see account. And you just click on that. And uh, it'll just get you to enter in like what you're graduating. And so just enter that in. So this, if this is the first time you've entered here, <coughs> And this is what you'll see. University of, I don't know. So just click on that and just wait for it to load. So over here, this is pretty much what you'll see. And over here, it'll say, please verify your student status. So if you click on that, um, it'll take you to a page and you can verify your student status. So. Has everyone here got a Microsoft Imagine code that they received? No one? Okay, well, I guess you guys won't be following along then. <laughs> so you, you will need to email um, nzedu at microsoft.com to get the code, and then we'll send that out to you guys. So Microsoft Imagine verifi verification code over here. And let's see, so this is the one over here. So you'll get something like this, um, like a code like this. And uh, you just copy and paste it in, and it should work. If it doesn't work, just email us, and um, we'll try and help you get that sorted. Uh, nzedu at microsoft.com. Sweet. So once you get to this page, um, it's pretty straightforward. You kind of just follow it through, and it should be pretty self-explanatory. So you know when you're verified, when you see this, um, so that's green, and this is the most important bit. So what we'll be using is Microsoft Azure mainly, and that's how you'll be able to host your web apps and like your databases or for your web apps and basically what you build in Xamarin. 
So you'll see over here it says activate Azure. So just click on that down there and then just click register now. Uh, so might ask you to, might be a pop-up, so just allow it. So just sign in again. On the day? Oh, okay. Um, I guess we'll just give that out maybe during the break or after this. Um, I might have to ask Jay to give them out because I don't have them at the moment. Yeah. So just try and follow along. Um, if not, just raise your hand throughout the day and we'll come around and help you get this sorted. Um, so after this, I'll ask you to enter in some stuff like your email address again. So just do that. And for your work phone, um, make sure it works because later on it'll ask you to it'll send you like a verification code, and then that will um, you have to enter that in. So you just do the same thing here. that. And then click verify code. So if everyone's doing this at once, you might find that this might take a while. So I remember last year, if we had everyone activating it at once, so um, that might be a bit overloaded and it would just be a bit slow. So just give it some time. Sweet. So just wait for that. So over here you'll see like, there'll be lots of like tutorials and stuff like videos that you can watch to give you a brief overview of what this is. So this over here is your portal and that's basically how you'll be creating your web apps and basically like be able to host stuff as well. So not everything on the portal is free for you guys, um, but most of what you'll need is free. So that's what, that, so that's what matters anyway, so it's all good. Sweet. So once that's done, um, if you click on that, it says get started with your Azure subscription. Just click on it. And then this is kind of like your portal, and this is where most of where, this is pretty much what you'll be looking at over the next couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much how you get Microsoft Imagine. Um, and this is uh, Azure, with Azure, so. Yeah, that's it for this part. Um, so I understand that most of you don't have the verification code. So we will come around and or just email it out to you guys and uh, hopefully that will get you sorted. And I think, so what's next on the time table? So, Code, are you ready? Yeah, okay, sweet. Um, just for, uh, for the verification codes? Oh, okay, sweet. Notify, notify okay. Sweet.
Um, so just two things. Um, so who, who doesn't have imagined codes? OK, quite a few of you, OK. So what we'll do is we'll go print them out easily so that you can just type them in easier, and we'll do that part. Um, so in terms of Wi-Fi, um, it looks like there's been a typo, um, but we don't know what the right one is. <laughs> so the university's given us the wrong code. Um, so if you can use, if, how many people don't have Wi-Fi? Just a quick question. OK, some of you. Um, see if there's a University of Auckland student that you can pair up with or an AUT student. Um, one thing to note is that, um, so if you're, so how many people are from AUT and don't have Wi-Fi? Okay, so those of you can use um, EduRoom. So um, what that means is, for, I'll show you now. So basically, um, all the campuses are on the same Wi-Fi network in some ways. So um, basically, you can just connect to our Wi-Fi network using the EduRoom um, method. Uh, so just yeah, use that. Um, so DreamStart codes will go um, quickly. Um, Get them, get them um, in the card format so it's easier for you. Make sense? So what we'll do now is we'll get started on installing um, Xamarin, and then we'll go from there. Sounds good. All right. Cool. All right, guys. Um, <clears throat> can I get a show of hand who has Visual Studio 2017 install? Okay, not that bad. Okay, for those who hasn't installed Visual Studio yet, um, I'm just going to show you guys quickly how to go about installing like Xamarin. Uh, if you've got, if you've got a Mac, um, you might want to install Xamarin Studio with Xcode. So. Um, Okay, so just quickly like go over to like visualstudio.com and as you can see that, that there's an option here. Um, commu community, uh, community edition is like totally fine, so we can go ahead and choose that. So save that and Cool. Alright, so just go ahead and like launch up the installer. Yeah. Forty gigabyte. Uh, <coughs> uh, get the USB from one of the MSP. So we actually have a USB installer. Do you guys have one? Oh, okay, so yeah, so like maybe after the uh, presentation. Just like follow along for now so you guys know like which um, workload to choose. Okay, so since I already got like Visual Studio um, communities installed, uh, the windows that shows up for you guys will be slightly different. Instead of saying like modify, it should probably say install. So just like go ahead and click install. And it should open up this window here. Okay, sweet ass. Um, just to like save time. Uh, okay, the workload that you guys need for now is just visual, uh, just uh, Azure development and mobile development dot, dot, uh, with dot .NET. So that's um, Xamarin. So like these two, did everyone get that? So you want to like um, 
take these two and then go ahead and install it. It should be like roughly, roughly around like 40, 40 gig, I think. Yep, and that's it. So uh, if you guys just get on to that um, for those people who haven't got Visual Studio installed. All right, thanks guys. Hey, cool, hey guys. Um, so we'll get on with the next session. Um, so I guess, yeah, intro to C Sharp. It's not really an intro. It's kind of just like, well, it is kind of an intro and kind of not. Um, wasn't sure what kind of level everyone's on uh, with C Sharp. Um, who here has done C Sharp before? Cool? OK, cool. So, so mo most of you will learn something new today, hopefully. Um, I'm assuming most of you guys have done Python then? Python? Yeah, no. Java? OK, well, those are the only ones I've kind of stuck off as a comparison. So um, if not, you probably would follow, follow along anyway. Um, so yeah, I guess um, before we begin, so um, yeah, .NET, .NET. So uh, the website's really good if you want to try out like a little snippet of code. Um, yeah, so if I just bring that up, um, so yeah, it kind of looks like that, um, and it has the uh, the normal structure of C sharp, which I'll be going through as well. Um, so if you wanted to follow along with um, some of the code that I have up on my slides, you can just enter it in here and it should um, run. Um, so you can see there's just an example when you load up the page and the output is down here. Um, so we could change that, for example, to be just Oop, wrong keyboard. Um, hello. And if you don't understand what that means at the moment, that's totally cool. I will go through that. Um, but yeah, just, just in terms of this, if you press run, you can see it changes down the bottom. Um, yeah. I'll just flip back to my own device. But yeah, that's, that's the web link there. Dot .net, fiddle dot .net. Um, I guess um, a couple of other things to note um, just with this uh, session. Um, you don't really need to memorize any of it or like the syntax or anything. Um, you can always search up these things. Like even, even for me when I want to make a list or something, I'll sometimes even Google it because when you switch between different languages, it can get a little bit confusing. Um, I guess the key thing to note is that it's good to understand how the code actually works and the logic behind it um, rather than the syntax. And if you do copy code from the internet, um, that's also key as well. You know, just don't just copy it. Uh, actually, understand what it does. Um, and yeah, it's all, I guess um, yeah, that's where the sandbox comes in handy as well, because you can always test it out before you put in your application. Um, so if we get straight into it, then, um, does anyone have any questions so far? Anyone? No. Feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions throughout this. Um, so yeah, basically most of my slides are structured like this. So you got Python on the side, Java, and these are all, um, I guess, equivalents or yeah, similar um, sorts of things. So each each one of these boxes um, at the moment just prints out "Hello World" or "Hello Python," um, and so this is the one we'll be focusing on at the moment. Um, so for those of you who've done uh, Python before, you'll note that you'd need this, and then you can do pretty much whatever you need to do. Um, and with Java, um, normally there's like a, a function or a method at the top here. Um, with C Sharp, there are a couple of things to note with this. So this is your basic structure when you create um, a class. Um, and so if I go through this line by line, you'll note that there is this using system. And so basically, this uh, the using is a keyword, um, and it's used to include the system namespace. Um, and so a program normally has many of these namespaces and system is like the most common one and it has the general like utilities in it. Um, and then moving down, so these are the namespaces. So system, the namespace system is included across all of C Sharp. Um, and then you can have your own namespaces, so you can define your own namespaces. Um, and what these namespaces are is a collection of classes. So if we go down again, you can see classes. So Many classes uh, will fit into a single namespace. Um, and then you can also use your own namespaces if you wanted to. So you could do using um, Hello World application um, up here if you wanted to include your own classes if you needed to use them in another um, area. Um, yeah, and so with classes, um, so this is the class, um, class decorrelation, decorrelation, dec yeah, declaration, yeah. Um, and basically it contains data and like methods. 
um, that your program uses. And so generally classes uh, contain multiple methods. Um, and you can see here, this is, this is a method here. Um, and at the moment we only have one method, uh, which is this main method. Um, yeah, and I guess some key things to note is um, just the way some of this is structured as well. So the capitalization, um, and I guess just before moving on, um, you'll note it has um, public here and public down here. Um, so basically what that means is it can be, it's, it's the level of access that you have to that specific um, class or method in a sense. Um, so for example, um, as you know, you can have many classes um, and within your classes you have uh, public methods. You can also have uh, private methods, for example. And so private methods can't be accessed from different classes. Um, but if it's public, you can access it from different classes. Now this may seem really confusing to begin with. Um, it even sounds confusing when I'm saying it right now. But um, when you do try your examples out, it will make a lot more sense. Um, yeah, and I guess for those of you who are moving from Java to C Sharp, uh, just to note, um, just with your method names, um, you'll note Java normally has first lowercase. Uh, with C Sharp, it's always first uppercase. Um, yeah. yeah. Is there anything else I need to touch on this? Oh yeah, and also one thing to note is that um, with classes, um, the first method it always goes into is the main method. Um, so with here, um, so it will pop into the main method first and then from that you can call other methods within that class. Um, yeah, any questions? No? Is this basic stuff for you guys? Do you guys already know this or not? I don't, I don't know. Okay, I'll continue. Um, yeah, so within, so within your classes um, and within your methods, you will have variables, uh, which is the ne next part here. And so variables um, are basically different things within your program in a sense. So uh, they have different data types. So like, for example, numbers, decimal places, um, words, or what we call strings. Um, there's also like Booleans, so like true and false. Um, so for those of you who are moving from Python, you normally don't have to define them. You just add in your variable name, and then you can do whatever. Yes? Python is dynamic. Yes, Dino, Python is dynamic, yep. Um, so yeah, normally you don't have to define them. Um, however, in C Sharp and um, in Java, yep, um, you have to um, specify the data type um, before assigning it to something. Um, so for example, if you want to use uh, words, you define the variable as a string. Um, for numbers which aren't decimal places, um, they're called ints or integers. And if you wanted to use a, a decimal, you could either use a float or you could use a double. Um, there are many data types. I've only included some of them up there, uh, just as an example. Um, and it's also key to note the, um, the, the ca uh, yeah, the casing there, so how it's lowercase. Um, and you can also use comments, so just a double slash is a comment. Um, with C Sharp, you can also use uh, something called var. So sometimes you may not know what the data type is. Um, and so if you use var, um, the compiler will just auto choose uh, the best data type or the most appropriate data type. Um, personally, I don't like using it, but feel free to use it. Um, it can get a bit confusing if you don't know what it is. Though if you do understand your code, it's totally cool. Uh, so for example, you'd just do var name John, and you wouldn't have to define it as a string. Um, yeah. And I guess um, just something with the syntax as well. Um, generally with variable names, um, which is these ones here, uh, you always have the first letter as um, a not, not a capital, it's a lowercase, and then any subsequent letters, uh, you'd have them as uppercase. Um, another thing to note is you can't have spaces. So if I went back to, um, I guess this here, uh, we can go ahead and define um, a variable, so a string name equals coder. Um, and also to note, you need to have um, these semicolons um, after them when you're using them uh, during the line. You don't need them for um, when you define your class or your um, methods, um, but for everywhere else you do need them. 
Um, and also to note, just this um, little exclamation mark, it basically means that you're not using the variable, so you can kind of ignore that. Um, if there's a red circle, then you know you've done something wrong. Um, so if I went here and then went um, and just added the name um, and then ran that, uh, you can see my name pops up here. Oh, yeah, my name is Coda, by the way. I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> Generally, I don't think that's very important. I mean, the content's more important than my name, but there you go. Um, and then as I mentioned, you could change, so if you didn't know what your data type is, you could just change it to var. Um, and if I ran that again, uh, you can see it doesn't throw any errors and runs perfectly fine. Um, yeah. Also um, to note, so um, the way you refer to your variable is also very important. So if I were to go and change this to a capital, um, you can see it comes up with a compilation error. Um, so whatever you name your variable, you have to use uh, the exact casing. So C sharp is case sensitive. Um, and as mentioned, see this little red cross that so says it doesn't exist. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll go back to the slides. Uh, any questions so far? Am I going too fast or is it right pace or? No, I don't know. Okay. Um, Okay, so it's, it's cool to be able to have variables, but you normally have to be able to do things with them, or sometimes you may have um, many variables that you want to kind of store in one area, um, or you want to store multiple things in one variable in a sense. These things are called like lists or collections. Um, so you can have a list of things, so rather than just having my name as Coda, maybe I wanted to add Coda and, I don't know, J into that one name thing, um, so I'd store it into a list. Um, so there are a couple of things to note when you're doing it in C Sharp. So uh, for those of you who done Python, normally you can just um, have a name and then you just add your things inside that list and that's pretty much it. Um, have in C Sharp, um, first you need to include the, the list namespace. So you need to go and um, have this using system.collections.generic. You need to add that onto the top of your um, class file. Um, and then you can go down here and add in list. Um, also with C-sharp list, uh, they have to be of a particular type. So they have to be either string, integer, um, whatever, and they can only include that data type. Um, so you can see here I'm defining a list of integers um, called list num, so list numbers. Um, and so yeah, basically this line here is defining the list. And so it creates um, the list num list in a sense. And then if I wanted to go ahead and add um, items to that list, um, I'd use the add method. Um, this add method is included in this namespace here, so you don't actually have to make that method or anything, you just call add. Um, and as you can note here, so if I try and add a string to an integer list, it won't work. Um, and then if I wanted to access um, this value here, number one, I would just refer to it um, using list num and then the position. So it always starts at position zero, and so as uh, the number one is the first thing I've added onto the list, um, it'll be at position zero. Um, there are also, um, so you got lists in C-sharp, you also got things called arrays. Um, and yeah, you probably will come across arrays. Um, I don't generally use arrays, so the thing with arrays is you can't, um, once you define it, you can't add extra items to it. So for example, if you define an array to have, um, I don't know, seven things in it, um, it becomes a bit of a problem to then, if you wanted to add an eighth item to it. So they're good for things um, where the lists won't change. So for example, if you wanted a list of, um, of days of weeks, uh, you'd probably store it in an array. You could also store it in a list, um, but you couldn't then, in, in, if you stored it in an array and then you wanted to add like an eighth day, if there was even an eighth day, you wouldn't be able to do it. Um, so yeah, generally I just use lists. Um, yeah, it's up to you guys. So, um, so I can add this example to our little um, sandbox. Um, yeah, if I went back here. Um, where is this? So yeah, um, see, I can only store one value in our string. Um, So if I were to use, so if, if I tried to create a list without um, adding in that namespace that I talked about earlier, um, it would probably throw an error. So if I go ahead and try and define a list, list of ints, 
or we could do a list of strings, just whatever. Uh, string uh, list names um, equals new list. Um, okay, see, so when we try and initialize our new list, um, it throws an error. Um, so you can always scroll over. Sometimes they provide good info on it. Um, so it says the type, uh, the type or namespace list could not be found. And it's saying, are you missing um, a direct clue? Um, so that's basically this, this using here. So you'd need to include the namespace in there. So if we go using uh, system dot, dot collections dot generic. Um, and you can see now it's happy. Um, so, yeah, so this this initializes the list. Um, and then if we wanted to go ahead and add items to the list, so you go list um, name dot add code it. Semicolon. Um, and you have to use a right variable name. And then I can go ahead and add other names to it as well. So list names dot add j. Um, yep, and then down here, if I wanted to access, for example, j's name, I can go ahead and just go list names. And then the square brackets, the position of where it would be. And as you can see, it prints out J. Um, yeah, I guess something I also didn't mention about variable names, they can't have spaces either. So um, see this um, string variable name here. If I went and did space and did name of person, um, it's not gonna like that because you can't have spaces. Um, so for example, if you did need multiple words, as I mentioned, you would just do a capitalization per new word. Um, yeah, there are also other methods you could use on um, your list name. So you can also remove items from your list. Um, you can also find the length of your list. Um, you can generally just see these methods by going list names dot, and then these are all the methods that you can kind of do on your list. So add range, you can clear it um, equals find. Um, yeah, so you can do a whole bunch of other things as well. So. I think there should be like a size one, maybe. Uh, there? Or it might be index up, but you can find the length of it as well. Um, any any questions so far? No. Um, operations. So. Um, there are operations you can do um, on on these programs or on in C Sharp um, or in programming in general, actually. So things like if you want to add numbers together, you want to minus them, divide, multiply, um, you'd use these ones here. Uh, you've got mod, so it finds um, the remainder of a value. Um, so it, it divides it and then whatever the remainder is, it returns. Um, Increment, so say for example, if you had um, a number, so an integer, and you wanted to add um, or subtract a, a one to it, so for example, you have like an integer two, and you wanted to add a one to it, you can just do um, plus plus, for example, rather than going um, integer plus one. Um, so those are kind of, um, yeah, mainly used, mainly used in integers. Um, add, you can add two strings together, so for example, if I had a string name, um, Coda, for example, and then another string with my last name, I could then add those two strings together um, using the, um, the add operator. Um, less than greater than equal to, so um, if you want to check if two um, variables are the same, um, you can use the equal. Um, it's good to do it with integers. If you wanted to compare two strings, you'd use a method, um, which is like the dot equals method. Um, and you've got not and um, yeah, it's probably, you'll come to find what these are actually good for when you try and do some examples um, in the sandbox. Um, and I'll go through these ones a little bit later. 
if I've included it. Ah, yes, okay, yeah, so decision making. So um, these last three here, um, they're really used in this next slide, which is the decision making sort of slide. And uh, I guess, yeah, these last five in a sense are all, will all be used in this decision making sort of stuff. So um, you'll note sometimes that um, if a variable is, um, has a particular value or, or if it's, um, yeah, if it's a particular value, you want it to do some things, otherwise you want to do something else. Um, and so to kind of do those sort of um, process flows, you'd use an if statement. So generally how it works is you have your if and then you have your condition. So for example, um, if someone's height is equal to 100 centimeters or if it's equal to or greater than 100 centimeters or if they're shorter than 100 centimeters, for example, uh, then you may want to do something. Um, and so that's when this if kind of comes in handy. Um, and then, um, so you can have an if, you can have an if else, so ignore this if here. Um, so if it's this, you want to do that, otherwise you want to do something else. And alternatively, you um, may have an if, an else if, um, there may be another condition you'll check for. So for example, you could do, um, I don't know, if uh, someone's weight is 80 kilo, else if, um, yeah, and so if it's not, if they're not 80 kilo, then you could do else if, if they're 85 kilo and um, 100 centimeters high or whatever. So yeah, um, yeah. I'll go do an example because that makes no sense. Um, so if I delete this. So what I mean is I'll, I'll define some, oh, are you not popping up over there? There you go. Find the variable, so, um, make one equals 50. I'm really just putting in random variables here, so, um, oops. Also, please name your variables meaningful names. These are bad variable names, um, just as a note. You go if, uh, for example, weight. Is uh, then, I don't know, 20. Um, See, so yeah, this is what's wrong here. Uh, ah. Okay, so we've got a basic um, if statement here. So basically, what it'll do is check if weight one is um, greater than 20, and if it is, it will go and do whatever's inside the if statement. So if I go ahead and run that, uh, compilation error. Ah, right, because I deleted that. Uh, Yeah, so um, as the, make that more easy, it's right up. Um, so you can see the weight is greater than 20 kilos, so um, or weight one. So it's gone inside the if statement, it's printed off weight is greater than 20. Um, and then it's gone ahead and done the rest of the execution as well. Um, if I were to go ahead and change this, say for example, if weight 1 is less than 20, um, you can note that as weight 1 is greater than 20, it doesn't go into here. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how you can use if statements. Um, and then when I was meaning the else, so you could go else, um, if I go here, else, um, console.
Okay, cool. So here you can see that um, we've got an if else here. So um, if the weight is less than 20, you want to write if. Yeah, um, you want to say that it's greater than 20. Otherwise, you want to say that the way. Wait a minute. My logic is not right here. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So basically, you say. No, this is wrong. Greater. Sorry, I'm trying to think and do this at the same time. Um, Oh, wait, wait, is not, there we go, it makes better sense. Yeah, so basically you want to say, um, so if the weight is greater than 20, you want to say that the weight is greater than 20 kgs, otherwise you would say that the weight is not less than. Um, yeah, you wouldn't do this normally, but I guess it's just kind of an example. Um, yeah, feel free to play around with that later on as well. Um, and I guess for those of you who are moving from Java to C Sharp, um, something good to note is just the way that the um, the way you kind of format your code. So in Java, you normally have your curly braces after um, the bracket. With C Sharp, you have them on a new line generally. Um, so there is another part of decision making. Um, that you can use in programming. Yeah, I mean, if you guys want to talk, feel free to go outside. But like, there are other people here that want to listen. Um, I don't mind if you guys do go outside and talk, but just don't do it inside. Um, oh, man, it's driving me nuts. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, so I mean, there's also other ways you can do decision making, decision making um, in C Sharp. So there's something called a switch. So instead of writing a whole bunch of if this, else, if else, if else, if else, um, that can get a bit tedious, so what we can do is you can use something called a switch. So you normally have your switch, you'd have a condition inside, and then you have various cases. Um, and so for example, um, you'd have a condition in here, and then if the case is equal to whatever is here, then you would do some code. Um, if whatever evaluates to be in here, so for example, you could have like um, a grade variable, and um, if the grade was A, you would do here. Um, if it was a B, you would go in here. And if it was a C, you would do there. Um, so it kind of just tidies up your code a little bit. Um, and just to know, if you do use a switch, um, if you do use a switch, you need to have a break after you've finished um, doing whatever logic in there as well. Um, so I can go ahead and just demonstrate that quickly as well. Um, ah, and I know how to do this. So if I go. Um, string grade is equal to A, for example. Um, so if, say, for example, if you wanted to do different things based on whatever the grade was, say for it was like a grade piece of software or whatever, um, you could do if grade um, is equal to A. So using, um, using if else, you'd kind of do this, else if grade is equal to B, you do that, and so on. Um, as you can imagine, it would kind of just go on forever. Um, and it's not, it's not really a good way to do it. So rather than doing that, um, what you'd do is you'd go down here and you'd go switch, um, and then you just put in grade. And so basically what that will do is evaluate whatever is inside the variable, and then, then you put in your cases, so you go, case, um, if it was A, um, you'd do something. So, um, and then you go break. Um, or you'd go case, B, and then you'd probably do something else. Uh, what is it complaining about? Ah. Um, also note the way you define your strings. So there are other data types that you can use for words. So there's characters, which are called chars, and there's also strings. Um, and the difference between them is the, the quotation marks. Um, so chars are used single quotations. Um, so we just change that to that. Uh, so if I comment that out. 
Um, yeah. You can also uh, comment up, <laughs> whoops, comment up blocks of um, code using um, slash star and then closing it off with a star slash. Uh, so if we go ahead and run that, hopefully it should work. Um, I will delete that so it makes a bit sense. Hello world A and B. Um, so you can see because grade is equal to A, it goes down to this switch statement and then it breaks off um, and it doesn't go in here. So if I were to change it to B, it should go to the other one. Uh, yeah, so you can see it's changed to B. Um, so yeah, this is just generally a better way to do this. Um, yeah, it's just a bit more tidier. Uh, cool, we'll move on. <coughs> okay, so now we have loops. So if we go back to um, thinking about the lists that we have, um, remember I was saying, um, if I go back to my, where is it, variables, collections, okay, so um, as you can see here, so um, say for example you have a really large list and you want to go through each item in that list. Um, as you can see here, um, in order to access it, um, I have like a position. So if you wanted each one of those items in that list, you would have to then go through like list num zero, list num one, um, and then go through like your entire list. Um, and especially if it's a dynamic list, um, for example, you wouldn't know how many items are in that list as well. And so then it can get a bit confusing on how to access whatever's in that list. Um, so that's one of the cases where uh, loops can come in handy. You can also use loops to do other things, so adding to the list or even doing other other things not related to lists as well. Um, so there are kind of two ways you can um, do loops. So you got uh, the first type is like a while loop. So while whatever's in here, so this is normally like a statement. So for example, um, you could do like while you haven't reached the end of your list, um, keep doing what's, whatever's in here. Um, or like, yeah, and so until it's, um, yeah, while it evaluates the true, we'll just keep doing that. Um, you've also got something called a for loop. Um, and so basically there are three parts to a for loop. Um, and while the condition is met, uh, it will keep doing whatever's in here. So basically you have your, um, you'd kind of set up your condition here. So you'd set it up. So for example, we've got an integer i. Um, so that sets it up. And then this here is the condition. So you can see it's, um, it's got one and then semicolon. This is the condition. So while i is less than 10, um, and then you've got here, so this, this adds on to the i, so then you don't see so that you can exit out of the loop. Otherwise, you'd always be stuck in the loop. Um, so basically what this will do is um, it will go i is equal to zero, so it initializes i. Uh, it's less than 10, so it does this. And then whatever, whenever it reaches down to here, it goes back and it adds one more to i, um, and this was that increment um, operator I was using before. Uh, so here, this will change i to one. It will then check that one um, that one is less than ten. So it will go back and do this, and it will keep doing that until i reaches um, ten, which then it's no longer less than ten, and then it'll pop out. Um, yeah. So you guys can try that out in that sandbox as well. Um, yeah, I think this is yeah this is the last slide. So, uh, just before I wrap it up, so um, as mentioned when I started the session, um, within a class you can have many different methods. So, <coughs> generally you wouldn't stick everything you're doing in the main method because um, it can be a, it's it's not good practice in the sense that um, you may need to reuse parts of your code again, and so it's no there's not good to just like copy it and then like paste it again. Um, so generally, if you come to a stage in in your um, in your coding, I guess, um, and you kind of think, oh, I need to use this block of code again, it's always good just to move that into a method and then call that method again. Um, yeah, it reduces the line of number of lines you have in your program and it makes it a little bit more tidier. Um, and so in order to do that, um, what you do is uh, you need to define your method. Um, so once again, you need its access level. So you've got public. Um, there's also other ones like private. Uh, I think there's protected as well. Um, yeah, there are, there are a bunch. Um, so you've got public and then static. So you don't always have to have it as static. Um, now, understanding this sort of static concept can get a little confusing. 
Um, it still, even for me, it kind of confuses it. How I kind of think of it is like, if your method is kind of like a tool, um, you would have it as static. So things like adding two numbers together, um, for example, if you want to compare two numbers, or um, perhaps you want to, yeah, I don't know. If you're, if you, if it's kind of like a tool, you would have it as static. Basically, what um, what this means is, um, if you have it as static, you don't need to have an instance of that class. Um, so, as you can see here, I can just call the method. Um, if this wasn't static, I would have to create an instance of the class and then use that class or the instance of that class to then call that method. Um, yeah, and that's super confusing, and it still confuses me. Oh, it doesn't confuse me, but it just, it just sounds confusing. Um, but yeah, you'll know when you need to use it as static, because the compiler will complain saying, oh, this method needs to be static, and you're like, oh, I don't know why, but I'll do it. Um, yeah. And then moving on, so you've got public static. Then um, if it returns something, so see here I'm returning an int, you need a, um, say in the method signature um, that it returns an int. If you didn't want to return anything, you would just have it as void. Um, so if I go back here, you'll note um, that the main, where is it? Yeah, see the main method, because um, you're not actually returning anything in the main method, it's a void. Um, moving on back to methods. Um, and then you would have your name of your method. And these um, don't necessarily need to be um, unique, but whatever the signature is in here, it would have to be unique if you're using the same name. And I guess just the convention in C Sharp is just to have um, capital letters uh, for the starting of the word. Um, yeah, and then you'll note here that you have these um, brackets. So if you wanted to pass in variables to this method, um, you'd have to define the structure within this method. So um, here you can see I'm calling the method, so that's its name, and then I'm passing in two ints because I want to add those two numbers. So in the method, I defined an int, int one, and int two. Um, you'd you'd name them a little bit better, as just an example. Um, so say, for example, if I didn't have int one and int two, I wouldn't be able to pass in two numbers into there. Um, and also with this, just to note that when you pass in, um, you can then refer to whatever gets passed in by whatever you've called it. Um, so you can see here I'm passing in numbers. I haven't passed in variables one and two. Um, but in the method which I've defined, I can then use um, one and, and two um, to do things. Um, yeah. Yeah, and you don't, you don't have to. You could just have empty brackets. So if you go back to that main method, you'll note that it's just um, two empty brackets. Um, I can guess I can go through an example just of this. Because um, there are a couple of things to note when you're doing methods. So if I go ahead and delete all this again. Um, yep, so you can see here, so you've got your public static void main. Um, there's nothing in there at the moment, and this is your main method. Um, so let's say, for example, um, int number, um, I won't do anything to it. Um, say, for example, I added two numbers together. Um, so, actually, I'll do this in, in another sense. Here, yeah. um, at number one is equal to one, and number two is equal to two. Um, so yeah, you normally wouldn't create a method just to do something as simple as adding two numbers together, but it's just an easy example for me to do. Um, actually, I don't know what I'm doing here. I just, um, I'll just remove that. Anyways, um, say for example, I wanted to, um, in multiple places of my code, I'm adding two numbers together, and I just don't like that plus symbol, so I'll create a new method, for example. So I'll go ahead and create as public. And as you note, you can't create another method inside of another method, so um, this curly brace here um, shows that it's the end of this main method. So after that, I can create another method. Um, with methods, they need to be inside classes, though. Um, so I'll go public. And if I don't add the static um, thing in yet, and just go int um, add numbers, for example. Um, um, 
Okay, so we've kind of defined it, but it doesn't like it. So um, remembering if you're defining as int, you need to do, um, oops, you need to return something. Um, if I just do return one. Why it is, yeah, so it's happy because it's returning a number. Um, and for example, if I try and call it, it won't be happy. So this is what I was meaning with that static stuff. So if I go ahead and just call <coughs> add um, numbers, Um, you can see it's not happy, and so um, because it's not static, it needs to have an instance of this program class. And so if, um, you wouldn't you wouldn't normally do it like this, but you would go program um, p for example new program. So here I'm creating an instance. Uh, if I go p add numbers. Um, so that's what I was meaning about that static stuff, but um, you wouldn't want to create um, an instance of the program class to add numbers, because um, it's more of like a, a tool in a sense. Um, that would probably work, I'd imagine. Ah, oh, okay, I'm not printing out it, so if I go um, console dot write line. Uh, chuck that in there. You can see it prints out one. Um, but yeah, if it's as, as it's kind of like a tool, I'm going to go ahead and add static in there. Um, static. Um, and because it's now static, I don't need to uh, create an instance of the class to call it, so I can just kind of call it like that. Um, and if I change this to two, um, you can see it's changed it too. Um, so that's kind of when you use that static um, name, in a sense. Um, so at the moment, it's not kind of doing anything. So if I wanted to add, actually add numbers together, um, if I try and just add them in here, for example, like two and like three, it's not gonna be happy because um, what uh, this add numbers doesn't have um, a signature with ints in it. So for this to be happy, I need to define that um, it can take an ints. So if I go int uh, one, you'd normally name it a little bit better, um, but int two, for example. Um, I'll remove that now. As you can see, as I defined that the method takes in uh, one int and another int, uh, this is now okay. Um, and as I've defined, so this uh, maps to that, and this here also maps to this one here, um, denoted by this comma. If I wanted to actually um, use whatever I'm passing in through to the method, I would then go ahead and um, I'll create a new variable result, for example, and then I'll just do uh, one plus two. Um, and what I'll do is I'll go and then I'll go ahead and return that int. Oh, return, 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 re result. Okay, cool. So basically what we're doing here is we're calling the add numbers method. We're putting in a two, we're putting in a three. Um, the process then goes down into our add numbers method. Um, it takes in two ints, as you can see here. Uh, we then refer to whatever's passed in with these variable names, so uh, one and two, and basically we're going to add them together. We're going to store them in the int variable called result, and then we're going to go ahead and result, uh, return result. Um, and yeah, and then it returns it back to here, and we're printing out five. Um, and then this way we could just do, like, we could change the numbers and it would be fine. And so basically, if we're adding in numbers, then um, instead of um, writing this line here. So normally in a method you'd have multiple lines. Um, so then you can just call that different times um, with different things. And now we're passing in a seven and a three and it's returning 10. Um, so I hope that kind of explains the use of methods. Um, and I think, 
I think that's it. That's kind of like the basics to it. Um, and they'll get you started on what you kind of need to do. Um, some good places to go if you want to kind of learn C Sharp. I always refer to um, a website called Tutorials Point. Um, I always find it's always good. It's structured well. Um, and yeah, um, well explained. Um, if there's any questions, feel free to come talk to me after. Or raise your hand now. Um, but I don't think anyone's going to raise their hand, so it should be all good. All right. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, awesome. Hope you guys enjoyed learning some C sharp, awesome stuff. Um, so, just following up earlier on the day, so um, I've got Dream Spot, uh, Microsoft Imagine codes here. Um, we don't have scissors to cut them, so just like cross it out when you use one. Um, and I'll just come around. So, who, who hands up again? Who doesn't have them? Okay, so I'll just like pass it around in the rows and just pass it along if you like need the codes pretty much. Um, so, do um, you have a question? Oh, okay, <laughs> all right, it's cool. Um, so, what we'll do now is a big part of the MSA program is meeting each other. Oh, uh, hello. Shh. Um, so, you guys, if you want to talk, like, you know, feel free to talk, you know, it's great, but um, it's just when we're up to the front, it's kind of hard for us to talk, like, because um, the audio is, like, amplified, so it's louder for us at the front, so that's the only problem, um, but yeah. Um, so, in terms of our next, what we're going to do now, um, there's two parts, and they're both very important. The first part is making sure that you've successfully installed Xamarin. Um, because in last year what happened was um, people thought they'd had it successfully installed and stuff like that. Turned out they didn't and they couldn't follow along for the next part of that, of that course. Um, so today in the afternoon, um, we're going to actually bring forward the schedule a bit and kick start at 1.30. Uh, it's 1.30 p.m. instead of 2. Uh, but basically um, the plan is we're going to get Jason and the MSPs to kind of deep dive into Xamarin and building out your first mobile app and deploying it. But to do that, we need you to make sure that you have Xamarin successfully installed. Um, I know that the, the file to install is 30 gigs or something like that, um, so if you haven't already installed it. Um, so I've got a USB here, and we've got more USBs coming. Um, so these have the full installer on them, so you can install them on your computer. Um, we do need them back at the end of the day, so, um, so we can use them again. So just the only thing. Um, so if you, need, if you haven't installed it yet, you know, come see us as soon as the social stuff is done and install it over lunch. Um, if you need Microsoft Imagine codes, I'll leave them, um, I'll, I'll pass them time around as well, and you can install them. And make sure that by 2 o'clock or 1.30 p.m. that everything's installed. Um, I guess we'll get started now. Um, so welcome back. Uh, just, um, so welcome back. So for those of you who don't, don't, rem don't remember my name, uh, my name is Jay. Um, so this afternoon we'll be covering off some more technical stuff. Um, so first of all, I'll start off by going through uh, Azure. So um, sorry, I'm just going to close this stuff. Uh, but going through what Azure is and some of the features within it and just giving you a quick walkthrough on some of the features within it. Uh, followed by this, we're going to get started into Xamarin and um, doing some coding stuff. And we'll aim to close off the day by 4 p.m. at the latest. Um, so before we kick off fully, I just want to say that by the end of today, uh, you should be able to kind of complete module one. Um, so uh, by the end of this whole thing, um, you'll be able to deploy an app, take a screenshot, and basically submit it. In terms of the submission portal, so um, you might have figured out by now that submit.msa.ms does not work. Uh, but what we're going to do is I've got a new one for you, which I'll, um, which I'll put up soon. But basically, it's aka.ms, which you might be familiar with, submit MSA. 
And basically, that'll take you to a website where you have to enter in your Microsoft email address, and you can basically hand it in. Um, so if I try my one, it should work, I think. Let's just see if this works. Oh, yep, it'll take you to the Microsoft login page. And, uh, and press X yes on permissions. <laughs> And basically, once it's done, it'll basically give you the normal submission portal where you can um, attach your screenshots and attach some other details and submit it. And it's all done in the system. Uh, you'll also get a confirmation email, but just be aware that this might go to your junk email. So just make sure you check that before you let us know. Um, you can, can you submit multiple times? It's not recommended, but. No, no, you can't. Oh, you can't, okay. So if you, if you, do, if you haven't received a confirmation email or something, just try submit again. Um, the app will let you know if, um, if you've submitted or not, or if it's had any problems. Uh, clearly this is taking some time, but that's okay. Um, so in terms of module one, it's quite simple what you need to do. So you need to take a portal of, um, of, your, Azure of your Azure subscription and a screenshot of Visual Studio um, with that name changed to your name in it um, so that we know that you know, you're the one that deployed it. Uh, I've had a few students during lunchtime talk to me about your, Azure, about your Microsoft Azure subscription and how you can't get it launched. Um, for some reason, there's some problems in certain, certain Microsoft accounts for some reason that says you don't have the Microsoft Imagine offer. How many students have that problem where it says that? Okay, a handful here and there. Um, the best method for that is to email nzedu, um, and what we'll do is we'll submit a bulk, bulk support request um, to our engineers. Alternatively, try create a new Microsoft account and see if that works, because we've got plenty of codes to go around. So just create a new one and see if that works. Yep. Okay, um, so the question was, for those of you that have done MSA previously, you might already have existing Microsoft Azure subscriptions. Um, continue using those, and when it expires, you can use your new one. Um, so they last for a year. Mm. Yeah, um, so yeah, just for that. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, usually the submission portal, oh, okay. The submission portal will get fixed soon, don't worry. <laughs> we have some technical problems of our own. <laughs> okay, so what I'm gonna cover off now for the main part of the day is all about uh, Microsoft Azure. So how many of you know what Microsoft Azure actually is? Okay, one person, that's great, so I can teach you a bit. <laughs> so let's go to that. I'm gonna use my device for this, okay. Uh, so, where is it? Okay, so I don't have any slides for this, but basically, um, but when you think of the internet, right, whenever you go to any website in the world or anything that you access, um, you're accessing someone else's computer in some ways, right? So when you go to you know, google.com, you're accessing Google's computer somewhere in the world or something like that. And what happens is this is what the computer looks like, usually. So if you have your home computer and you're you know, logging into that, it's got an IP address to it and you can log in, you're accessing your computer. Uh, generally speaking, about 80% of the world's web traffic resides in servers like this. So these are massive, massive data centers um, that exist across the world in various different forms and various different places. Uh, many companies have their own in-house servers. So those of you that study at the University of Auckland and AUT, um, so both those university data centers are actually in this building. So if you go to level one car park, um, all four levels of the car park have some form of, um, not as high tech as this, but some, some form of data center where all the web traffic and all the files and folders you access go down there. Um, their primary function is to process and deliver data as fast as they can. Um, so the ones downstairs, because um, I used to work at the university, the ones downstairs have 10 terabyte solid state disks, and they basically have um, about 100 of them, and they just process bulk loads of data every second, uh, millisecond, basically. So these are very, very big and very, very scalable infrastructure solutions. And the one downstairs, um, the university one spends about 500,000 in electricity per month. So <laughs> you can imagine how much processing it does per year. That's one of the biggest bills that the university faces. Um, when, you, when you scale that out to something like Microsoft or Google, these are massive, massive data centers, massive, massive builds. So our ones, we have hectares of land, 
um, all over the world, and basically just massive um, compute power. So that kind of gives you some context on, on the power of, the, of these data, data centers. The thing is, um, the main question is, how do you access this resource, right? So this has got all these compute power. It's on 24-7 with 99.99% reliability. Um, so if something breaks, then we provide a guarantee that we will provide compensation if, it, if, it's, if the downtime is below, um, up, above 0.1%. So that's how reliable these things are, enough that we can provide compensation to businesses across the world if something goes wrong. Um, so in terms of Microsoft Azure, so we have around 34 data centers across the world, um, just like the ones we have here. Um, so just think of your computer times 1,000 and in different places across the world. Um, the closest one to New Zealand is in Australia. So we have one in Sydney and we have one near Melbourne. Um, that's basically, and those are basically identical. So across the world, we have identical data centers that all have the same, mostly have the same capabilities and the same feature sets. We also have special, um, special data centers in places like Germany and China to account for special uh, geographical restrictions, for example, on garment data and healthcare data and all of that. Uh, these data centers can basically do anything you ask them to, which I'll quickly show you so that you kind of have some picture on what you can use. So in terms of these data centers, all these data centers are also connected. So when you deploy an app um, in Azure to a data center, for example, in Australia, in Sydney, um, that data can also be replicated, for example, in um, Beijing. So what that means is if for some reason there's a natural disaster in Sydney or um, there's some kind of fire in that data center, all your data is replicated in another one and we'll automatically switch you to that data center and you keep going with no, no downtime. So you can imagine um, a previous, uh, quite a few years ago with the Christchurch earthquakes, um, a lot of companies in the CBD, they couldn't access their data um, simply because you know, they couldn't enter their premises and all that. Um, the companies that had their data on clouds like you know, Azure or Amazon's AWS or Google Cloud, um, they're able to get their business up and running the very next day. So you can kind of see the business reasons why you'd want to use something like Azure. And obviously the other reason is cost. So, uh, when you go into your work placements or when you go into your industries, a lot of companies may have in-person data centers. Um, what that also means is they'll need a staff to manage it. So the university, they've got 24-7 staffing downstairs in a windowless room, um, just managing that data center, you know, three shifts a day, 24-7, every day of the year. What that means is it's quite expensive. If something breaks or there's a fire or something else, it's very expensive to fix it. For us, um, in terms of scalability, the cloud, the, reason, the biggest reason the cloud exists is cost, right? Um, now all you need to do is you need to, need to deploy a web instance to something like Azure, and immediately we take care of all the infrastructure, all the data, all the costs and everything else, and you pay simply in terms of the amount you use. So that leads on to kind of scalability. So when you think of scale, um, so for example, all of you would have you know, been interested in building apps and things like that. Um, those of you that have done, you know, like some papers on, um, you know, data structures and algorithms will know that programs operate differently at, you know, for five users and they operate differently for a billion users. And one of the things is your data center can cope potentially with about 20,000 users, but how will it manage 100,000 users and how will it manage a million users? Now, if you're a company like um, the Rugby World Cup, so one of the biggest customers that we had recently was the Rugby World Cup for Microsoft Azure. Um, you can imagine that their usage only increases once in four years. So on average, they get about 100,000 visitors per month, for example, on any given month during the year. And then when it comes to the Rugby World Cup, they get nearly a million visits per day or something like that, something crazy. What that means is before, they had to have this massive infrastructure running for four years just for that one day of the, of the finals and stuff. Now they can, they can just use Azure and scale it up and scale it down as much as they need in terms of scalability. So those are some of the reasons why we have um, data centers and why they're so popular nowadays. Uh, what I'm gonna do, now that you kind of know the context behind how, how it is, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna show you to the portal and show you some of the features that Azure can do. Um, so let me do that. Oh. So does everyone kind of understand Azure and like what it is now? Kind of thing. Anyone have any questions about it while it loads? No, you're good? Cool. Okay. Uh, mine seemed to log in. What am I doing? Why is it? Oh, this is my one. Hang on. Let me just 
As it happens, I'm on a different one. Let me just disconnect my VPN. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Microsoft isn't letting me disconnect from my VPN. <laughs> nope. Okay. Oh, okay. Looks good. I'm just going to um, sign out and quickly show you what your portal looked like. Uh, so when you type in your um, Microsoft email address, you'll get taken to your Microsoft uh, login page, which is different. And just log in. And hopefully you'll get some information. Cool. So this is the portal that you will see, um, which is more appropriate. <laughs> um, so um, initially, as soon as you come to it, you'll see a bunch of stuff running. Uh, or you might have something blank. Most likely, you'll have just blank pages. Um, oh, anyway, can you just get my charger? I'll say thanks. Um, so this is the dashboard, right? So everything in here is just uh, like a quick overview of what's going on. Um, if you look at service help, you'll see these green ticks. So this basically shows our data centers and um, if there's any problems in them. As you can see, all of them are running really well and there's no problems, which is all good. Yep. Okay, so this thing about the location, say there's a big thing like a people database on six east of Australia. Yep. Yep, um, so the question was, can you deploy it to one data center and then deploy it to an, another one? Um, the answer is yes, you can. Um, and you can just press, create a clone and just duplicate it and just deploy it or deploy it to multiple ones. Um, I'm not sure, I'll come around and help you later if you want and fix that. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, so in terms of Azure, so um, next step. Um, so you might, so all of you should hopefully have a subscription good to go. Um, if you want to check, just change, just type in subscription. Oh, wrong one. I want to get rid of this keyboard so I don't do that. Put in. Okay. So just type in subscriptions, or on the side, um, just type in subscriptions or billing actually, and this will tell you if you have a subscription or not. Um, so all of you should have a subscription called Microsoft Imagine or Microsoft uh, DreamSpark. Um, if you've been there previously, you'll have what's called DreamSpark and. If you've just signed up, you'll have something called Imagine. So, um, and all that is, is, so we give you, as students, access to free uh, websites and web tools and a subset of the features that you can use. Um, if you want to create your own startup, we also have a program called BizPark where you can get uh, f access to around uh, $15,000 worth of Azure for free um, if you have your own startup. But regardless, so, um, so that's that. Uh, just a note, you should not enter your credit card details into Azure at any time. So just letting you guys know. So some students, you know, they, you know, they ask for credit card details and something like that. Um, entering the credit card is only if you want to use features outside of the free subscription and only if you want to like, you know, create your own apps or something like that. Um, most likely you probably won't need that and you certainly won't do that for the MSA program. But you're welcome to do so if you want to spend money on Azure, you're free to do so. <laughs> Pays my bills, right? <laughs> um, so. Let me just quickly show you some of the things you can do in Azure, and then before I hand over to the, to the guys doing Xamarin. Um, so um, I've actually got a bunch of resources already running, so I use um, Azure quite a bit at home. <laughs> um, so for example, uh, let me go through some of the features that you can use. So if you press that uh, plus button there, it's called the new function, and you can basically, uh, it'll immediately give you a bunch of options, right? So within Azure, it's basically a full computer and you can do anything you want in it. So um, how many people here are comp sci, computer science backgrounds? All right, most people. Are there any networking people here? Anyone or anyone familiar with networking and stuff like that? Okay, some people, okay. Cool, so, um, so Azure has a bunch of functionality in terms of what you can do. So to give you a quick summary, you have what's called compute. Um, all compute is is basically just virtual machines that, that you can then use to create your own instance of computers. And you can basically create massive, massive computers um, that are basically virtually hosted in Azure. For example, uh, let's see what I can use. Let's go with, what should I go with? Let's try Ubuntu. Uh, okay, maybe not Ubuntu. Uh, <laughs> just realize that's a bad idea. Uh, uh, 
And if you create it, okay, so it asks you about for a bunch of stuff, but uh, oh, it doesn't go to the next page. Okay. On their one, yeah. Oh, yeah. Web app, yeah. Um, so, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to show them the. So, so you can create virtual machines if you um, pay for it, unfortunately. Um, you also have things like, uh, net, so in your subscriptions you've got limited things, but for example, if you go into a company and they need you to do networking stuff, you've got virtual networks ready to go as well. So you can create your own virtual networks. Um, we also have databases. So these are your standard SQL databases that you can create. So you might have used SQL Server at home or have your own little databases. You can also store them in Azure in various different forms. Uh, what we'll be using today is web apps. So this is the thing that we'll be using, a mobile app, um, which we'll cover later. So today we'll be just using the stuff, but um, there's a bunch of other things in here that you can use. Uh, another cool thing that we won't cover today but we'll cover in future MSA workshops is cognitive services. So in the morning you might have seen a few videos about um, just Microsoft doing cool stuff with technology. Um, cognitive services lets you do that kind of stuff. So um, it's like a mini brain. And yeah, so um, just, have a, just have a look inside and have a nosy about all the various things that are available. Um, it's got a big subset of cool stuff that you can do, use. Uh, basically, anything that you need to do, Azure can do it for you, um, basically. Even blockchain, funnily enough. <laughs> uh, you just don't uh, do dodgy stuff with that. <laughs> so um, what I'll show you now is how to create a web app. Because I know that all of you, you know, it's, it's all fun to create a website, right? Um, so if you press new, go web plus mobile, and press create a web app. Is everyone following along? No? no? Okay. Where, where are you guys lost? Should I just start from the beginning? Yes, yes okay. <laughs> All right, let me go back to, should I do the full introduction again? <laughs> All right, let's not do that. Okay, so I'll go back on the side and I'll go a bit slower. So this is the Microsoft Azure dashboard. Uh, this is your home page. This is where you know, all your resources come and where you can find all your stuff. Uh, as students, all you need to know for now is how to create a new instance. So to create a new instance, press new. Good. Once you've pressed new, <laughs> um, you will have a bunch of options here. It's called a marketplace and you'll have a few options here. Um, press web plus mobile. <laughs> Everyone happy? Yes? I'm not seeing people nodding. Okay, that's good. I need some feedback so I know. <laughs> okay, press web app. We're making a web app. Okay, so enter a name for your app. Don't copy my name because then I can't use it. So. <laughs> Oh, damn. <laughs> Clearly they've used this name before. <laughs> um, just like type in, type in a name that's rememberable because you're going to go to this link later on. So I'm going to type in uh, jtestSite. Okay, jtestSite works. Um, make sure your subscription is DreamSpark and nothing else. Microsoft Imagine. Yep, that's fine. So. Um, DreamSpark and Microsoft Imagine are the same thing. Um, our branding people like to change names around a lot, so <laughs> yeah, Imagine is fine. If you don't have that, just follow along and just kind of um, see how, how it is happening. Next thing, you'll have what's called a resource group. So um, in Azure, we try to be beginner friendly, so um, generally speaking, if you don't know something, there'll be a little information tick right next to it. So here you'll see it's got a little information tick saying a resource group is a collection of resources. Um, so what that means is when you're creating, for example, a project, um, generally speaking, um, for complicated stuff, you'll have a variety of different things in that project. So you'll have a database, you'll have an API service, and you'll have a website and some other stuff. Um, what you'll want to do is you want to group them all in one resource group so that you can manage it, in, manage it quite easily. Um, that's what it is. And just create a new resource group if you want. So I'm just going to call mine MSA group. Oh. Cool. Everyone happy with that? Yep. All right. All right. Next up, it's, we have to create an app service plan. So app service plan is basically where the business people come in and tell you um, which subscription you need to do. 
Um, for us, we're gonna create our own app service plan. Um, basically, this is the pricing of it, right? So, um, luckily, DreamSpark doesn't let us go crazy with it so that we don't accidentally burn through money. Um, <laughs> but basically, just create an app service plan and call it, uh, I'm just gonna call it plan one or something. Um, so one thing to note is that there's different pricing in Microsoft Azure for different areas. So you don't need to worry about that, obviously, but just for your you know, background information. Um, different regions have different pricing points. So the Australian ones are quite expensive, usually, um, relatively expensive. They're still very cheap compared to most things. But you know the American ones are the cheapest simply because they've got bigger servers there and stuff. And you just gotta pick the bit one that you want. So um, for us, I'm just gonna pick Australia East. Um, it's always a good idea to pick the data center closest to your customers. So if you're thinking of um, deploying an app for, to example, South Americans, then it's better to pick something in Brazil because you know, it's closer to your customers um, and the latency and things are lower. So for those of you that play like online multiplayer games and stuff, when you're hosting servers and stuff, you know, it's always a good idea to host it closer to your core audiences, so core gamers, so that's how you do it in this. So um, Australia East is the best one. And finally, we have to select our pricing tier. So Azure has quite a few features, right, in terms of pricing flexibility. Um, if you, when you get placed with an organization, you'll um, go through uh, various different ones. Um, and Azure gives you a lot of flexibility. So what we're creating is a web app today. So you know, all of you know what a website is, um, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, basically, you know, a website has some server back into it and it's got some code to it and it's got an infrastructure behind it. But a website also has some other things behind it, right? Um, on the free tier, all we get is a shared infrastructure platform, which means we're sharing that website's, um, co website's infrastructure with other people, and we get one gigabyte of storage to ourselves that you can store anything you want in there. And by one gig of storage, this means that you can store anything you want inside that. However, if you go, when you get placed, you can also go for other things. For example, you can spend up to 1,300 a month, and you get a four core server in Azure just for you, with the website being backed up 50 times a day. <laughs> just in case you feel like, just in case you like backing things up that often. And you get 250 gigs of storage and all sorts of other things as well. So you can see there's a lot of flexibility in that. But for us, we're just gonna pick free storage and press select and press okay. Oh, okay, and then you'll come back here. You should note, in summary, just make sure all of this is good before you start deploying or you might have a few problems. So make sure your app name is ticked uh, you're on DreamSpark or Imagine. You've got an MSA resource group or like some kind of resource group where it's got a tick next to it. And you've selected your app service plan and it clearly says your plan name and your location. Is everyone following along so far? Yep, yep cool. Um, finally, I just want to add um, app insights. So you don't need to enable this if you don't want to. But all this does basically is it creates a separate instance automatically that lets you track usage. So you might know kind of Google Analytics and all these other things that lets you track you know, usage to your site and stuff. This is kind of different in some ways, but it helps you track the backend services on what's going on on your site and stuff. Um, I just turn it on because it's good to have you know, extra data, and I think it's free. Is it free? I don't know, let's check. Oh, it doesn't say, but <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, there you go, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so what's happening now is it's actually creating an instance in the cloud. So you saw this, I showed you this photo before. So somewhere in this data center in one of these servers somewhere, um, Azure, these mini robots on Azure are going around and they're creating a little web instance for you. So you literally get like a little piece of Azure <laughs> for that price that you paid, which is zero dollars. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, has anyone else's failed? Has anyone succeeded? Oh, still going, okay, mine's failed for some reason. Uh, okay, you succeeded, okay. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, okay. So it turns out JTest site already exists. <laughs> <laughs> right. Someone obviously took it here. <laughs> right, just so you know, you shouldn't follow the one that I'm building. <laughs> you can do it one at a time. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay. 
Right, so don't copy this one, please. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to disable that for now so you don't see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hopefully it's deployed for everybody else. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. So J test site 22 wasn't taken. <laughs> All right. So um, how many people are at the screen now? Quite a few people. Okay. So if you want to get to this, so um, this is the screen that you want to get to. If you want to get to that, go back to your dashboard and just press Microsoft Azure on the far left side, and it'll take you back to the dashboard. Um, once you're there, before we add, I just want to show you a very important feature. So if you press the background, it can change color. So <laughs> just in case you want to get different backgrounds. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so, so what we want to do is we want to access that resource, right? So now that you've created it, so now that you've created it, you want to access it. So press all resources on the left-hand side. So some of you might already have it on the dashboard, but go all resources anyway. And in there, um, you'll see a bunch of resources. So um, your one should be in there somewhere. So your, my one's J test site 22. Um, you should have pretty much only one, I think, and yours should be there as well. Is anyone's not there? OK, it looks like everyone's, everyone's got it there. Cool, sweet. So just press J site 22 or whatever your one is. And immediately, it'll, it'll open a new tab on the side, and it'll basically give you like a like a bunch of things here, right? Um, so now you want to check out the site, right? So just press the URL, and it should launch it. And boom, so your app service has now been created. So basically, you can access this anywhere in the world. So you can go home and tell your parents or tell your friends, hey, visit um, your site, <laughs> azurewebsites.net. <laughs> and basically, it'll um, show, show them the site. Now, the thing is, um, you can also um, add stuff to this, obviously. So we're not going to be covering this today. But basically, you can, um, if, you, if you create like a website on GitHub or Bitbucket or something, you can basically connect it to Azure and deploy it on the site. And it'll always be up 24-7. Um, yeah, there's some stuff in here. So you've got things like, um, you've got various other things in here. But um, if anyone's interested in doing that stuff, I'll just quickly show you. Uh, it's called, uh, where did it go? It's called. Uh, uh, it's probably that one. Yeah, so um, you've got to go to deployment source, and basically you can kind of select different things here, right? So if you just have like a website on Dropbox, or if you have a website on GitHub or something, all you need to do is you just need to connect up your GitHub to, your, um, to this Azure thing, and it'll basically just do it for you, and you have a website ready to go, basically. Um, I might actually have a site ready to go. But that's fine. I won't show that to you now. Um, basically, if you're interested, do that in your spare time. Um, so that's kind of Azure in a nutshell. Um, some things I want to show you, some handy tips, is just in terms of navigating the site. Um, so around 80% of the problems that you'll face in terms of Azure are just simply related to the dashboard, because it's got so many features, and it's easy to get lost sometimes. So first of all, there are two dashboards. So there's portal.azure.com. And you might sometimes accidentally end up in windowsazure.com as well. Um, but if you end up there, just go back to portal.azure.com, because it's the newest one. Some other things to note is um, you have some options up here. So um, you can kind of change some various settings here and some various things. So if you have a very slow device, you probably want to disable some of the animations and some of the, like, some of the things so that the portal runs faster. Because it's, it's quite a resource hog on your, um, on your machine and stuff like that. Um, other things, so uh, there's also help. So you might realize sometimes that you don't know how to do things. Um, we have help ready to go on the, on the top right-hand side. 
Um, I think some of the support requests cost money, but so don't go for those ones. But most of them's available here, so just that. And the other thing is, it's always a good idea to kind of check your billing and stuff as well. So um, you might realize that sometimes it says that um, you can't deploy an app or something like that. Uh, a lot of the time, it's because you've already deployed like 10 web apps, for example, or something like that. So just make sure that you kind of know um, your subscription and what it entails and all of that. Um, so yeah. So are there any questions? There's a quick 101 summary of Azure. Everyone happy? All right, cool, I think. Who's up next, I think? You guys, right? Oh, these guys. Jackie's up. Oh, Depeche is up, yeah. Oh, right, submission, okay. So while we're waiting um, to get started, um, um, so I'll just quickly show you the submission portal again because I know it wasn't working before. So just ak.msh slash submit msa. Oh. Submit msa, not submit msa, yeah. And you'll log in. So just wait there, yeah. And press yes for um, the uh, um, for the access permissions, and then you'll get a dashboard like this. So once you're here, um, just attach your Azure screenshot and your Xamarin screenshot. Um, because you've logged in with your Microsoft account, we have the other details um, from you, so don't need to worry about that. So the question was, what do we screenshot? So uh, where is it gone? Oh, let me just. Oh. So what you need a screenshot is your Azure dashboard. Sorry, on the screen, and the Xamarin app running um, running Xamarin. So for the Azure screenshot, all we're looking for is your Azure dashboard. So if I go to back to my dashboard, all we're really looking for is that web app. Where did I deploy it? Oh, not the web app. The one that Jason's going to show you, but. We want to see a screenshot of this, basically. So all we want to see is just like a screenshot of this. Everyone happy? Pardon? Yeah. Except um, instead of a web app, you'll have the app that you'll create today, um, not the one that I just showed you. Um, for your um, Xamarin app, we'll, ha we'll be doing that demo today, and you'll know what to screenshot later in the program. I mean, later today. All right, everyone happy? Are there any questions about the submission process or anything else? All right, if not, um, yep. Where can we get the PDF? Oh, PDF. So um, to get the PDF, you have to go to MSA Drive, which is msa.ms slash drive. And that's all in the handbook as well. But to get to the handbook, you need the MSA Drive. So <laughs> That one there, module one. Cool. Um, if that's it, I'll hand it over to Depeche and Jackie, who will cover off introduction to getting started with Xamarin. Um, hopefully, all of you have Xamarin installed by th at the moment. Um, does anyone have the USBs? Who has the USBs? All right, um, so if you guys are done with them, I'll just collect them off you um, soon. Um, sweet. Thanks, guys. Cool. Yes. Sweet. So um, you guys just talk among yourself while we set up, and then... I'll let you know when we're getting started. Can I help? Okay, guys, we're going to start up again. Hopefully, we don't have any more questions, but if you do, um, feel free to come see us later on. So, um, I didn't introduce myself before. My name is Jackie, and this is Depish. And today, we're going to give you like a short introduction of what Xamarin is, so basically why you're here today. So, you must be wondering what Xamarin is. Well. Xamarin is a cross-platform toolkit that allows you to develop um, apps that can, sorry, develop apps, let's say, on your, your Android, your Windows, or your iOS, without you having to code for the same app three times, like three different times, OK? So um, when using Xamarin, when you've got an, um, an app on your phone, that you're working in two main parts. There is your XML-based language and your C-sharp. So, there we go. Yeah. Um, your XML is basically your visual appearance. So it's like the buttons that's on the screen, like something that you can see. And then your code behind, which you use C sharp for, is things that runs behind. So it's, it's not something you can see, it's something that runs behind. So like the logic of what happens if you click the button, if you touch that button, if you slide this thing, that sort of thing, okay? 
Um, so basically, yeah, the code behind is what determines how the user interface um, behaves. So your user interface is your, is your UI, and your UI is basically what you see and what is displayed on your screen. For all you beginners, I mean, like, we all start somewhere. Um, and then in the industry, you should know that there are actually large companies which use Xamarin. So it's not just some thing that we're trying to bring up in the market. It's actually pretty big. So you've got companies like Slack, Kellogg's, Fox Sports, JetBlue, Alaska Airlines, just to name a few. So these are like large companies which actually use Xamarin's in like Xamarin forms. So when you come to making your first app, you'll be introduced to the MVVM pattern. So what this pattern is, like, has anyone heard of it before? You have? Great, you don't count. Okay. <laughs> okay, so like, um, group, um, all start somewhere. Okay, so what the MVVM is, is that it stands for the model view view model pattern. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Model view view model. And what it is, is that it's a structure for how you format your code. So when you're making an app, or let's say like when you're writing an essay, you've got your writing structure of how you should have your, like, your introduction, your body, um, three bullet points, sorry, like three body paragraphs and then your conclusion. When you're writing your code, you've got the same sort of um, structure that you need to do. So what we do is the model view view mo um, model pattern. And when you normally use it is when you're developing a heavy weighted app. So maybe let's say you're working in, like a, in a team environment and then by structuring your code in like a particular standardized way, that means that you can all work together really easily and it's um, easily maintainable, it's reusable, it's just, um, conventional, that's the word. So um, just to tell you, give you like a little visual example of, oh, sorry, a visual demonstration of what the MVVM pattern is, is that you're working in two main parts, like your view and your model. So as I explained before, your view is like your buttons, your objects that's on the screen, something that you can visually see. And your model is the data entity. So it's, let's say, like the things that stored like the um, information that's stored in the back end, you can't see it. So what the MVVM does is that it's an intermediary, um, you've got an intermediary part in between these two, and that is called the view model. So the view model is essentially the logic that's, um, that connects your view and your data entities, like things you see on the screen and the stuff behind it, okay? So the, l yes. That's right, it's, yeah, that's right. Cool. Um, <laughs> sorry, um, I'm still learning myself, in all honesty. We all learn, we all start somewhere. So basically, where was I? Oh, you've got your view model, which is like the intermediary part that links the things that's on your screen and the back end stuff. And so basically, um, what connects the view and the view model is a process called data binding, and what connects your view model and your model is called referencing. So let's say um, I'm, I'm on my earpods, I'm listening to music, um, and I click the button for the next song. So basically, I can see what song is on my screen, on my phone, let's say, and that will be in the, my view section. And then when I click on the button, the the app would then use data binding going through to the, to the model to grab the data and all the information for the next song and then bring it back through into the view to let me see the display of this is the next song that's going to be played. So are we all on the same page? Yes? Hands up. Thumbs up. Okay, good, good. We're all on the same page, just making sure. And then, yeah, that's basically it. That's the MVVM pattern. I'm going to pass it on to Pesh now and he's going to, sorry. Slightly different. It's more okay. like used with mobile development. This one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sweet. Cool. Okay. So I'm not sure if you guys have actually created a um, project yet. I think you have, right? In the morning, uh, like a Xamarin project. Not yet. Okay. So later on, you're going to be doing this um, with Paul and Amrit. But um, essentially, there's when you create a new project, um, there's two options that you can pick from. And there's the options are PCL, Portable Class Library, and Shared Project. And um, there, there, there's another um, 
method as well, but we're, we recommend using PCL um, because the code is cleaner and hence uh, more readable. Um, in Xamarin Forms, um, there's lots of examples of shared projects when it initially came out, but, um, and a lot of people still use shared projects, but um, yeah, like I said, that portable class libraries is the way to go from now on, especially with larger projects. Um, yeah, the major difference is, I'll, I'll go through in more detail, but the PCL uses something called a device class, whereas shared projects use this um, if, elif, and endif, which, is, which are compiler directives. Um, so this is quite a complex diagram. You don't really have to worry about it. Um, yeah, essentially, um, shared projects, um, they have limited use, but they're used normally for backwards compatibility reasons. Um, you can create classes per usual uh, similar to PCL, um, but yeah, as I mentioned, these are compiler directives, which are like this hash if and all that, if you're uh, familiar with C++ or C or something. Um, yeah, that's about it for that. Yeah, so PCL, um, they, they have their problems as well, um, but essentially they provide a great way to um, write code once that can be used on multiple platforms easily, uh, which can be easily maintained and tested. Um, essentially, yeah, using PCL helps with easier unit testing, which some of you guys might like doing, and um, easily, you can easily read the code and greater, port greater portability, and you can have better implementations of your code. So this is what I was meaning by the compiler directives. On the right hand side is the hash of elif and endif, and on the left is um, what PCL uses. Uh, you don't really have to worry about this, but essentially when you, say for instance, if you had to do some sort of padding on your app where you had to like, because I know with iOS apps, they have a different sort of padding at the top to Android. And so if you did it this way, then you could um, essentially write specific code for that specific OS. Um, uh, now I'm just gonna show you quickly, if I drag this over. Um, uh, let's see if this opens up here. Nope. No. Pardon? Mm, I'm just trying to drag it over. <laughs> There we go. Okay, so uh, I've created a portable class library already. You're gonna learn how to do this later. But essentially, um, if you, this is uh, the structure of your portable class library. And, and you see here, there's an Android project and an iOS project. And essentially, um, I'm gonna just give a high level overview, but this is your XAML, which will have your welcome for Xamarin Forms, which is just a basic template. And um, the main point to go through here is when you create the project, which you don't have to write any of the code f uh, that converts this XAML into your um, Android or iOS projects, but under references, you have your, essentially your DLLs which do all this stuff for you. And the other main thing is if you were to click, um, right click on portable and then go to properties, um, under targets, you can see here that um, these are the different uh, things that essentially your application will yeah, target. So I've got iOS, Mac, and yeah, so on. And you can change these as well. So yeah, I think that's pretty much quite simple and there's not much to it. There's not much that you guys really have to do. You just have to make sure that you're using a PCL project when you're going to be making a uh, submitting for your um, assessment or whatever. And I think now Jason will go, oh, who is it? Yeah, Paul and then we'll now go over how to actually get to this point. Cool, thank you. So who actually got like Visual Studio and um, Xamarin install? Can I just get ahead? Okay, sweet. Who's like, it's been confused the whole day? <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> So I hope this part's gonna be a little bit more fun since um, we're gonna go through like 
coding the actual mobile app. So if, you, if we could just get you guys to like follow along and hopefully we don't go too fast. Okay. Oh. Awesome. So you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Emret and this is Paul and we'll just show you how to make a simple app and then deploy it as well. Awesome. Um, so we're It's not, it's not. Oh, is it not coming up? Oh. Where am I? Oh, sweet yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, Amrit's going to show you how to create a new SAM reform project in Visual Studio. So let's go ahead and do that. So if you just oh. um, open up Visual Studio, it should look like this. Wait, it's not coming up. It's not oh. Hmm. Is it? Is it to do with the I cable? Think Might be the cable. And it's this one. We'll try another port. Hang on. It's because we're using a Mac. Just give us a bit of time. Yeah. <laughs> I've got another adapter. Uh, wait up, wait up. Just replugged. Is this parallel? Yes. No, it's boot camp. Oh, boot camp. Oh, here we go. We got it. Yay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I think it's why is it not coming up? Oh, right, right, right. It's not. It's not mirroring. It's um. It's, it's over there. One second. It's extending. Yeah. So. yeah. No, just this. Oh, okay. This that fails. Okay. Okay. Should we try that then? Yeah. I'll just quickly set it up. Display. Is that all good? Oh yeah, look, that looks great. Um, okay, so um, just get your Visual Studio open and have it take it away. Does everyone have it open? Okay, sweet. So this is what your module one process should look like. So if you go on file, new, and go on project, and in Visual Studio C Sharp, um, we want to choose a cross-platform app. Give it a name. That's and an just awesome click OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, here, you want to click Xamarin.Forms and Portable Class Library. And OK. Is everyone going good? Oh, are you on Mac? Oh, OK. Um. Are you on San Yeah, we can just pause it. So if you're using um, Mac and you're using um, Xamarin Studio, you should go about doing this. Um, you've installed it. So it's on GitHub? It's on GitHub, so you can find it later. Um, so here, a new solution right here. And then app, forms app. Next, give it a name and make sure all these options are clicked. Does anyone need help? I'll come.
So to find his GitHub page, it's github.com slash um, nzmsa. And it's 2017 phase one. <laughs> this is a UCS account. <laughs> Is everyone up to speed? Can you go down? Oh. No, no, no. As in, like. Yeah, so um, for the Xamarin Studio, just click all these options should be clicked except the use Git and and automated. And then you just need to click create. Is everyone up to it? Who needs help? Be brave. Okay, cool. Sweet. Um, yeah. So. Just cross all of these out. You don't need those. Oh, sh Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you look here, is everyone looking? Um, in the drop down menu, just choose 23 by 86 phone. That's the emulator that we'll be using right now. So configuring the emulator, just click on this little phone icon. And you should have this open. This is only for um, Windows, not for Xamarin Studio. And then just click 23 by 86 phone. Edit. And then under CPU slash ABI, click here and choose, make sure this is chosen. Intel Atom. Intel Atom, here. Yeah. So click here, 23 by 86 phone. Click on that little button. It's called this little icon. Open Android Emulator Manager. <laughs> so make sure you have the Intel Atom and then click Edit AVD. And that should that make it like ten times faster. And that should make it faster, hopefully.
Hey guys, a um, quick announcement on the people having issues with Microsoft Imagine. Um, so if you can't, like, if you, if you use Jack, some other account and says your Imagine subscription isn't available, um, simply create, using incognito mode or something, create a new Microsoft account and try it through that, and use one of these um, Imagine codes to verify it. So go through that method and create something new. Oh, okay, cool. Come on, no, yep, sweet. If you have any questions, just come to me and I'll help you get registered on that. Sweet. So just to quickly show that again, um, we go to Open Android Emulator Manager. Okay. Um, so if you're like missing options or like you weren't uh, you weren't able to get that to work at all, just follow along for now, because we probably have to move on and. Yeah. All this is on GitHub, so you'll be able to find it. Okay, should we show that um, Android SDK Manager as well? Just yeah. quickly, yeah. So if you see here, if you can see where I'm pointing, um, click it and go yes. This is for those who have like Android phones. If you want to plug in your Android phones um, and deploy your app on your phone, you need to have this option. Google USB, Google USB drive, it should be installed. But um, if you don't want to, don't want to use your phones, then it's just fine. Yeah. So here you have like a simple app that you've just built and it will just deploy it by doing <laughs> control F5. Just press control F5. Or you can also press that little green button at the very top as well. Just make sure this. it's pointed to um, x86 phone. Um, if you in, if you chose Xamarin when you install uh, Visual Studio 2017, those four emulators should already be pre-installed for you. Here's a simple mobile emulator. And if you go here, you can see all these apps that are pre previously there. And the app that you just made should show up soon. Oh, here it is. Awesome J. Currently, it's not doing much because we haven't told it to do anything yet. It just says, welcome to Xamarin Forms. Um, Paul will take you through making a button in your app. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. If you can help him, because like his problem is quite it's a bit off. What happened? It's to do with like missing Android SDK. Would you be able to help him? I can go check it out. <clears throat> okay. Um, can I get a show of hand who actually got to this part? Okay. Um, Number of you? Okay, cool. Um, all right, so for those who didn't quite get anything to work, just follow along for now. Um, for those who, are, who got their project up and running, and did you guys get like the um, emulator to work? If not, like don't worry, just follow along for now. Um, yeah.
All right, so um, I know that you guys want to you know, like dig in and start coding, so I'm going to show you guys exactly how to go about doing that. So it, on the right, you have the solution explorer, and here you have the, ma the main page.saml. So if you can double click on that, that should open up the main page of our app. As you can see, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit here. Okay, so on our main page.saml, we have a label that says welcome to Xamarin form. And yeah, you can see that. This is our main page, and it's got the same thing there, which is our label. So let's go ahead and honor um, Awesome J app by changing that to created by Awesome J. And I'm going to relaunch the app just to see um, the differences. So control F5, and that should relaunch our app in the emulator. Awesome, so now it says created by Awesome J. Cool. Um, did anyone actually get that part to work? Like changing the suites? Some people? Some people? Okay, sweet. Um, I'm deploying the app. The, the emulator is just blank. It's like redeploying the app. Just redeploying the app? Yeah. So if your emulator is blank, just um, try redeploying your app. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So Awesome J app is not really that awesome at the moment. So. How are you even having problems at the moment? Like, raise your hand if you're having problems. OK. Well, OK. Was having problems. OK. better than last year. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so um, we'll come around and I think we'll stop for five minutes and come around and help people that are having problems. And then we'll carry on. Cause like, so what are the common problems you're facing? Can someone shout out what problems you're facing? Like. Just deployment errors. Deployment error. Um, did you guys get the emulator option? Like, do you guys do you guys have this? But um, were you guys able to like launch it? No. No. It's just error when you're trying to like um, start the project. Okay. Would we would we be able to fix that? Mostly, it's about like launching the emulator. Yeah. Then try that as well. Yeah. It's not that difficult. Uh, you just kind of figure out what the problems are, I guess. Okay, so how many people are having problems with just deploying the app? Okay. How many people are just having problems with Xamarin in general? Okay. A lot fewer hands are going up now. <laughs> okay. Okay, we'll pause for five minutes and we'll come around and figure out what the problems are and we'll make an announcement on it as well. Um, so if you're having problems, just keep your hands raised because it's important that you solve it now rather than get lost. So um, just raise it, keep your hands, hands raised. Cool, um, let's just aim to get to like this blank salmon form page. Um, so if you have your emulator problems and you're running a Windows device with an Android phone, um, you can deploy it to your Android device as well. So if you're having some problems, just saying.
Um, so who's still having problems? Okay, a few people at the back? Okay. All right, so come around quickly. Um, so who still has a USB stick on them? Just quick hand of chance, I know. Okay, one person. Who's the other person? Okay, cool. Thanks. So um, yeah, for those who haven't quite got the Samarin form up and running, I'm sorry about that, but probably going to have to move on. Cool. Um, so just try to follow along. Um, All right, so um, to make this app a little bit more exciting, we're going to go ahead and add in a button. So before we can do that, we actually need a tag that call stack layout. So if you go, um, yeah, I'm going to do that again, actually. So for those who doesn't, come, uh, doesn't have like programming background, to write a tag, you just simply go um, open angle bracket and then start typing. So we want to we want to put in stack layout, and um, Visual Studio does give you like an auto completion, so you can actually just press enter, and don't forget the closing ang angular bracket. And essentially, what this stack layout tag does is that is that it allows us to easily arrange all the components on the page. So we want to place all our components with in between these opening stack layout tag and the closing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move this down to the bottom so that our label component is within these tags. Uh, just going to 
Oops. It's hard to do it without a mouse. <laughs> okay, that looks much better. Cool, so to add a button to, add a button to our um, main page, we're gonna go ahead and create a new tag. So, button, and let's have a text attributes uh, text. And let's call our button, um, We'll call it Mysterious Button. <laughs> Winky face. Because, <laughs> you know, like, you, you don't know what's going to happen when you click the button. Anything could happen. E even nothing. E nothing could happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so let's make it more exciting. Uh, we're going to add in an attribute called background color. Does anyone want to give me a shout out? What, what color do you guys want for, like, pink. red? Pink. pink. Huh? pink. Red Okay, we'll make it pink. Light pink or hot pink? <laughs> of course, hot pink, okay. <laughs> Hope this doesn't break our ab. <laughs> so, uh, and then we're gonna put in some arrangement options. So, for vertical options, just let's have it center and expand. Horizontal, center. And don't forget to close your tag. Just go like forward slash and that should close your tag automatically. Okay, so now we should see that we have a button on our main page and a label underneath. So let's go ahead and relaunch our app, Control F5. Just give it some time. Oh, you can just go control F5 and it will just like relaunch itself. So that looks beautiful. So <laughs> awesome J ha app now has a mysterious button. So what do you guys think if you click on that button? Nothing. Obviously nothing happens. <laughs> okay, so how about we go ahead and add some interaction to our buttons. Um, on the main page.saml, if you guys open up, if you, if you guys expand it, you're gonna see main page.saml.cs. So let's go ahead into that file, double click that. And here, we can probably add a event handler for our buttons. So that should add some interaction to our buttons. So I'm gonna go ahead and initialize the event handler. So a sync. Um, let's call it button clicked. I know this is looking quite intimidating um, for some of you, but oh, okay. Um, don't forget the return type since we're not gonna return anything. So let's have it uh, void. Okay. So um, examining this like uh, method signature, essentially what sender object does is that it. Referen uh, reference to the object that fired the event. So that would be like our button in this case. And for the event arcs, it's just like, it, it contains the information that associated with the um, sender object here. Uh, it's not really important at the moment. Um, but what we need to do here is that we want to be able to access the attributes uh, that associate with this button here. So I'm going to pull up this main page, side by side. Is that too small to see? No, okay. Okay, so we've got an event handler uh, method over here and this is our interface. Let's go ahead and create a um, button within our method. So button type, we call it button object equal, and we're going to cast our sender object as um, button type. Okay, so what this line of code allows us to do that is um, now we can access the attributes that link with our button over here. So if I go button dot text, now I can change the text to um, Let's say when the user click that button, it's gonna change to you clicked me. <laughs> okay, 
Cool. Did everyone kind of understood that? I, I hope. <laughs> Pardon? Did you mention the screenshot? The screenshot? All oh, right. Um, so you know how you change the text for your uh, main page? That's basically the module one submission. So yeah, we've gone a little bit further. So you just have to screenshot your emulator yeah. with your name on it? Oh, feel free to like do more stuff. But yeah, this is just like an intro. So that, huh? Yo. Sorry, can you just scroll across? Uh, on my code, I'm just using uh, an error alert to be an arg. Okay, sweet. So, um, so now that like you guys can kind of see that once the user clicked that mysterious button, it's probably gonna change the text on the button to you clicked me. But how about we go ahead and add some more stuff. Let's go ahead and add um, display alert. So await, and we're gonna call a function called display alert. And essentially what it does is that it's gonna um, raise that dialog box when you click the button. So this function actually takes in three different um, parameters. First one, like being the title. Can you guys see? I'll zoom in a little bit. Oh, sweet. Thanks, Carter. That looks better. <laughs> cool. So the first um, parameter that we're going to pass into the display alert function is going to be the title. So let's have our title of the dialog box be, um, let's say, warning. And then the second uh, parameter is going to be the message in the, in the dialog box. So uh, let's say something fun like, um, Unknown territory. How about we do like, how about we do this like, your phone will explode <laughs> in five seconds, you know. <laughs> so it's a little bit more fun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the third parameter is going to be the label for your like close button of the dialog. So uh, let's just say like, no. <laughs> okay. So if we kind of did our event handler correctly, it should be fine. <laughs> but one thing that we haven't done, which is really important, is adding this attribute uh, in our button that will trigger this event handler. So I'm going to go ahead and put a new line underneath a hor hor horizontal option and have an attribute called click. And this is going to trigger button click method over here. Okay, I hope you guys will like manage to follow along. So now what's gonna happen is that we have a button call, uh, with the text mysterious button and when the user click this button, it's gonna trigger uh, the button click method over here and all of this stuff should happen. So let's go ahead and try that. Hope everyone's ready. <laughs> Okay, cool, so we still have our button and our label and our app still hasn't crashed, so I think everyone's, uh, everything's gonna work. Are you guys ready? <laughs> okay, let's go, let's go ahead and click this button. Okay, so as you guys can see, it popped up the dialog box that we wrote here in the event handler. It even have the button that says no. <laughs> so let's try that again. Yeah, it, it works. <laughs> Okay, if you guys notice, the text on the buttons also changed to you clicked me because of this line over here. Yeah, awesome. So that should give you like a basic introduction to um, Samarin app. Yeah, hope you guys had fun. Did everyone kind of like, who, who managed to like follow along and like got something working? Okay, some of you. Okay, sweet. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much, guys, for listening to me and Amrit. Um, good luck for the rest of the program. If you still have problems, just put your hands up and the MSP team will come and help you. Sweet. Thanks, guys. Um, so we'll quick, take a quick five-minute break um, while we set up next. Um, if any problems come up to us, um, we have, I think this lecture is being recorded for the rest of the day, so if you have any problems or you, know, you got confused with something, um, we will post it up so you can kind of rewind and follow along. And we'll try and put up tutorials on the GitHub as well so that you can follow up.
But it was, did everyone kind of get that and everyone kind of follow along, mostly? Everyone happy with it? Who found it fun? <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> for, for how many people was that the first time you've ever have deployed a mobile application? Oh, nice, awesome, fantastic. Well, you've done the hard part now, so it's just building it up. That's, um, that's all you need to do now, so cool. So next up is Jason. So we'll start that at, in five minutes, basically. I think we will uh, get started. So does everyone have um, Azure activated? Because we will be using it in the next part. So we need Azure activated and we need uh, Xamarin installed and running. Has everyone got that? Yeah, cool, all right. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go into Azure. We're gonna create a new mobile application. From there we're gonna enable, um, we're gonna set up a Node.js backend for that um, mobile app instance. And then we're gonna create a to-do table and then we're gonna download like a sample template from Azure, which has every like all the connections that we need in order to talk to Azure, insert data, update records, whatever, and then from there we will um, have a look to see exactly how how that's happening inside the Xamarin application, and then we'll go ahead and enable Swagger inside our mobile application so that we can have a look um, at the data and like manipulate and see exactly how we can do all that. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna open up our browser and go straight to portal.azure.com. Log in, I've already logged in. Um, is, is, everyone, is everyone logged in? I'll give everyone some time to log in. Who hasn't logged in? Who's not, like, who doesn't have the screen? Just, just one? All right, well, we'll continue. So what the first thing you need to do is you need to click this plus button at the top there. Maybe a little bit slow. Uh, then you want to go down to Web Plus Mobile. If you click on that, you should see Mobile App. It should be grayed out. Don't worry, you can still click on it. If you just click on it, um, you'll get this little pop-up. You can still create an instance of a mobile application. I don't know why it's grayed out but it is for some reason, it's always been grayed out. Um, yeah, like the first time like I, I created, like, cause we, we did this like last year as well. And like mobile app was like grayed out. I'm like, all right, well we'll go and create a web app. And then someone's like, no, 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 you can still do it. I'm like, no, you can't. But it turns out you can. <laughs> all right, so I'm just gonna smash my keys cause I don't really care about that. <laughs> I'd be surprised if that was taken. I'm going to create a new uh, resource group. Zam. I'm just going to leave everything the way it is. Pin to desktop. Dashboard. Dashboard. Yeah, it's pretty handy. Uh, and then create when you're done. So, yeah, that's all I've done. Just give it any app name. It doesn't really matter. Well, it kind of does matter, but for the purpose of this demo, I don't really care. All right, so we'll just wait for uh, the app to deploy. So is everyone following along? Yep. yep. <laughs> Someone. Our resource group, oh, all good. All right, no worries, no worries. I'll just quickly redo it again. Whoops. Hopefully it worked this time. So who's uh, mobile app actually did create? Yeah, pretty much everyone. All right, <laughs> mine mine actually worked this time. All right, so who who's up to this part? Well, who isn't up to this part? Hands up, guys. Just a couple. Uh, whereabouts are you guys up to? Are you up to? Are you, is it still creating?
So those of you that recall, so this is the same step as we did before. Um, it's just instead of a mobile app, instead of a web app, you're using a mobile app. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it should be the same. All right, so once you're up to this step, now what we have to do is we have to actually um, create a database that our application is going to use because we're going to be using our mobile app to handle data. So we're going to send it, we're going to receive data, we're going to do all that. So what we need to do now is we need to just scroll down and create a new uh, SQL database. All right. So if you just scroll down to the bottom here, you got data connections. It's right underneath mobile. You got easy tables, the easy APIs, and mobile con oh, data connections. So if you click on that, um, you shouldn't have anything here should just say no data connections. So if you click the add button at the top here, you're gonna be taken to this screen, you know, configure required settings. Uh, this here should pop up. I'm just gonna give it anything, it doesn't really matter. Uh, target, you just have to step through these and just like do one after the other, it's pretty straightforward. So uh, set up a server as well. Uh, we need to give it a login username and a password. Yeah. So what you need to do is you need to go onto mobile con uh, data connections underneath mobile. Click the add button. Come across here. Uh, required settings. You go click on that. Um, create a new database. Just give it any old name. And come down to target settings, uh, create a new server, give it a name, You've got to give it an administrator name and password as well. So you just got to enter it in twice. And then once you're done, click select down at the bottom and then wait for further instructions. Did everyone get that? It's pretty straightforward. It's just click, 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 click. One more time? Yeah. Okay. So on the side here, you scroll down, so you got all these different um, options. You got mobile. You want to click data connections. Mobile. Pardon? You need to click on your mobile application inside Azure. Yeah, you need to give it a like a login, like username and password. It can be anything, but yeah, you kind of have to remember it. Make sure it's something easy that you will know. Just in case you ever need to like log into your server and and get it out of it. All right. So yeah, click the plus button at the top. Uh, configure required settings. Give it a database name. Target server. Create a new server. Give it any old server name. Uh, give it a <coughs> server admin login. So, I, I, you know, admin, whatever, doesn't matter, whatever whatever username you want to give it. Then you have to give it a password, you have to confirm it. And once you're done, click select. And then it should get, all this here should all be like, it should fill out for you. So you just click select again. And then click on that, yeah, that's all good, okay. And then when you're done, all you do is click okay. And then Azure will go ahead and, um, create that database for you. So you click OK, there we go, and then we'll just leave. This takes some time, so we'll just we just leave it for a bit. Just wait for it to, to finish, because we can't progress for, until this is finished. So, might as well wait. Hopefully this works. So I was doing it a little bit before and like every time I try to create a database, I got this like four four or six zero 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 error, which is really annoying. So hopefully we don't get any errors. Hmm? 
Ağzı. created uh, my database for me. Uh, who's still waiting for their database to create? Yeah, a couple. All right, so we'll just, we'll just wait until that's done. May take some time. If you get an error, just do this like, process again. And if you still get an error, then no, no, no. Delete the resource and then create the mobile application and again and do the whole thing from scratch. So if everyone's waiting just for their um, database to create, those who are waiting, can we can can you like stand up and then when you when it's finished creating, just like sit down, so we can see. Because essentially you don't need. Oh, oops, did I break it? Oh no. Just to go great. Mr. IT support. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's done for me, but we have to wait for everyone else so we can continue. The database. All right, so who's still waiting for their database to create? Couple, okay, okay. Uh, so who actually has their database created? A good, good portion of you, all right. I think we'll continue. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, everything's gonna be up on GitHub anyway, so if you fall behind, like, just go on GitHub when you get home. All right, so now that we got our um, database uh, you should have this. Whoops, we'll just exit this. MS tables uh, connection string, you should have that. You got that, then all good. So what, now what we want to do is we want to go to easy tables at the top here, and it should ask us to enable um, mobile service. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to configure easy tables slash easy APIs. Click here to continue. So essentially all we're going to do is just uh, Acknowledge that it's going to wipe everything, like our entire web app. 
and then re, re, like recreate it inside Node.js. So all you have to do, I accept, initialize that, and then just let it do its thing. So click Easy Tables, and then you should get a prompt saying you need to configure uh, mobile services for Easy Tables slash Easy API. So you just click on it. It'll take it to the screen. If we, you should see this at the top here. Right underneath Easy, if you click on Easy APIs, you'll get the same thing. So you just click on it, scroll over. I acknowledge, initialize that, and I've got an error. See, this is this is the error I was getting before, which was pretty annoying. It's straight. It's right above data connections. All right. Let's create it again. If you get this error, this like uh, SQL error code 4,060, um, yeah, the way I got around it is I had to recreate the entire uh, mobile application again. I, I got the same error. All good, because I did this earlier on today, so through the magic of presentations, I guess. I don't know. Um, I already got one created, so it's all good. So, yeah, you just initialize it, and then once you initialize, if you go back down to, uh, where is it? Where is it? Easy tables. You you want to see this uh, to do item? You'll just see blank, but like you won't see that thing at the top saying to initialize. Um, what to call initialize? That that thing that was at the top there before. All right. Pardon? <laughs> oh, no, 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 to do it, I don't want to come up. No, no, no. So if you see something like this, they see there's no results, but you got an add button at the top and you don't have that prompt telling you to initialize anything, then you're all good. Now what we want to do is we want to actually um, go and create the, the sample project. So who's who actually initialized and didn't get any errors in that and sees this? Pretty much everyone. Awesome. All right. So what we want to do is now we just want to go up to the top here uh, underneath quick starts. And then you should see, you should get a list. Um, iOS, Objective-C, Swift, Android, uh, Windows, C-Sharp, uh, Xamarin as well, and Cordova. These are our sample projects um, that has all the connections to Azure already done for you, so you can go ahead and actually look through the code and see exactly how the Azure SDK works and how you can implement it inside your own applications. So. What we're going to do is we're just going to go down to Xamarin Forms and click on it. Um, we've already got our database connection done, which is all good. You wouldn't have this, um, this little tick here, because you haven't done that yet. All, all you have to do is just uh, select your mobile language back in to node.js and then uh, click I acknowledge that will wipe everything and then go create table item. So that there will create the to-do item or to-do table item, whatever the thing I had inside my uh, easy tables. So we'll, we'll just wait for that to recreate. Hopefully I don't get any errors. But yeah, do this. Like, click, I acknowledge, and then create easy, easy item table. So essentially the sample project that Azure gives us, it's a simple to-do app. So, so you can just, so you can enter in some data like, Go, I don't know, do grocery shopping or whatever, and then it will send it off to Azure and then it will install it, like it will insert it into our easy table. Then from there we can uh, fetch it again and we can delete it and we can do everything we want. So we'll just wait for this to do its thing.
So once it's finished, it should give you this. App, service, app, backend, initialize. If you got this, then cool. We'll move on. If you don't, put your hand up. One, two, three. So I'm assuming everyone else ha sees this. Yeah, all right. I assume correct, all right. So if you just scroll down, uh, create a new app, and we'll just want to go download. Um, if you already got an existing application and you just want to connect up the, if you just want to connect your app up to the back end, um, just click this here and it'll tell you exactly what you need to do. But uh, we're just going to create a new app. So once you finish, you should give you this uh, little zip file. Uh, uh, just uh, create, new, create a new app and just hit download. Yeah. And then I'll give you a little zip file. Download. Then once you download and you unzip it, whoops, where's my cursor? You should get something like this. You should get your Droid, iOS, UWP, uh, WinApp, WinPhone 8.1, as well as your portable project. Um, what you, all you have to do is just uh, double click on the .sln file, and then Visual Studio should pop up. Okay, so if you open up inside um, Visual Studio, you should get a couple prompts. Uh, we don't want this. You, you'd probably be asked, Universal, do you want to install this uh, Windows 10 SDK? Do you want to install UWP development? Um, you can in your own time, but right now we, we don't have that installed. Whoops. Oh my god. Okay, yeah, so when you get home, you can install it yourself, but we're not, so we're just gonna click skip for now. Oh, yeah, and then you'll get this pop-up saying uh, migration error because we don't have the SDK for UWP installed. We've got two errors here, which is fine because we're not worried about uh, Windows 8.1 or UWP. Um, so that's all good. So we go back to Visual Studio. Uh, we should get this blank project. All right, so now we'll just wait for everyone to catch up. Who's, who, who's up to this step? Oh, nice one. So how many people are at this step right now? Okay, who's having problems? Okay, so what part are you guys having problems at? So, um, so are you guys still on the Azure portal? Or? So how many people are still on the Azure portal? Okay, All right, do we just wanna? So how many of you have successfully done the data connection part? Okay, so you guys have done that and you're stuck at that point, right? Okay. Just on that. Oh, no, no. So all of those guys, yeah. they're pretty much like nearly to this dude. They're just going to get to them and all that. Yeah, okay. But, I mean, because I've been asking. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Should we just the problem is how you're gonna take it from here. Um, from now, from here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work on the front, yeah. the shirt, the dot going, and then enable swagger and just showing the tables so they can manipulate it. And then the uh, I mean, if they're following along, it's probably going to be one of them. I mean, it depends if they actually keep following, because then we have to wait for them. Okay. I should just pause for five minutes and help yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll just um, pause for five minutes and help the people that are behind. Um, keep your hands raised so we can help you, otherwise we won't be able to like catch up with you. So just keep your hands raised and we'll come along and help you out before we continue. Hey guys, um, just a quick notice. If you miss out on Amrit and I part, you know, like deploying a simple app to, if you miss that part, don't worry about it. We'll like do a quick video tutorial. Do you guys want like a quick video tutorial? On yeah, okay, we'll do that and we'll upload it onto like the GitHub page. So um, you guys can go over that later. Sweet.
Someone probably took it. I don't know where it is.
right, so who has their sample project running or like opened up in Visual Studio? Hands up, come on, like no, yeah. A good number, who hasn't? Who's still waiting? Uh, what are you waiting on? Oh, okay, okay. All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and continue. All right, so now that we've got our uh, we've got our sample project. Um, we can have a look and see exactly how it's doing everything. Uh, okay, so if you open up like to do item manager, scroll down, uh, this basically, um, this is how the application is talking to Azure. So it's, uh, it's also got offline enabled as well. Uh, okay, where's the actual connection string? Uh, constant. So this is our application URL, like this is our endpoint. Um, so when we created our app, our mobile application inside Azure, we had to give it a name. This URL is essentially the URL for our mobile application. So whenever we make calls to our backend, it's using this URL. Um, I'll show the actual data connection, like the actual URL path that it's making inside Swagger once we have enabled it. All right, so. Now we've got this, we're gonna actually just quickly go ahead and run it. So by default, it should be set to this portable um, library at the top here. We just wanna change it to Droid. So, well, Droid for me, because I've got an Android phone. So I'm gonna go ahead and connect it up. So I'll go ahead and run it on my phone. We'll just wait for it to boot up and I'll just show you exactly what the sample project gives us. This may take some time, hopefully not too long. If you do have like an actual Android device, I recommend just deploying straight to your phone rather than going through the emulator. I always seem to have issues with the emulator and like just deploying to your phone is always quicker, I guess. It doesn't, uh, no, no, it doesn't have to restart or anything like that. All right, so here's my application. Wait for it to load. All right, so, what, what, what the project that we downloaded from Azure is essentially all it is is just a to-do app. So I've got um, a little text box at the top here. I can enter in any anything, like hello world. And then click add. Oh, whoops. I don't have internet. Hold up. Yeah. So it looks like the sample project doesn't have any like handling if uh, there's no network connection, which is kind of bad. But it's fine for us. All right, turn on hotspot. All right, 
there we go, now we've got internet. Just go ahead and run it again. Fresh. Hello world. Add. So when we click the add button, it goes ahead and inserts it into Azure, and then we get a response back with the data we just inserted, and we can actually see that inside Azure. If we um, go back to our uh, portal, Whoops. so we go back to our portal and we go over to our easy tables, wherever that may be, easy tables. So we've got this to do item. If we click on that, now we should see the record I just made, Hello World. So if I go ahead, so you got this completed um, column right here. Uh, right now it's set to false. If I actually click on it, click complete, uh, which I forgot to show you. If we go back here and we just quickly refresh it, they both should see true now. So essentially that, so there we go, that's proof that we've actually placed something inside a database and we're getting it back. So if I just type, if I type anything here, and go plus, and then we should see this on the side here, refresh, there we go. That's the data we just entered. So there we go, we can see it's like working, we can see it's connecting. So if we want to actually, to so say like, if we want to be able to um, like, to so say if we actually deployed this and we got, and, we, and developers can actually um, plug into our API, um, they would need to know like exactly what kind of calls that they have to make in order to access the data and all that. So there's this really nice tool called uh, Swagger, which kind of allows you to, it does all that kind of documentation for you so you don't have to actually worry about it. So if we're gonna go ahead, you, you don't have to follow along, but if you do wanna follow along, then follow along. I'm just gonna go over real quick because it is four o'clock right now. So if you just go edit scripts at the top here, what it will do is we'll open up Visual Studio Code and this is where we can actually edit all our scripts for our backend. So if you wanna, if you wanna create like a API and you wanna be able to um, uh, do stuff with that API, you can actually just edit, like click edit scripts and then this will open up. You can add your logic directly inside your browser. You don't need any additional code or any additional software to be able to do this, which is pretty nice. Um, it's all there, you got your console as well, um, so you can easily debug as you go and it saves automatically. And as soon as you, so if you edit anything, it saves it and it goes live straight away. You don't have to worry about anything. So uh, no, having, that's the benefit of having a Node.js backend for your mobile services. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna click this button over here, open console. And then I've already, I've already done it before, but essentially if you just, into this command, uh, in npms install hyphen hyphen um, save swagger UI. That's essentially all we have to do. Just click enter, and then I'll go ahead and it'll install it for us. This will be oh like this will be up on like GitHub as well, like the step by step guide. So. Um, it's okay if you don't follow along. I mean, you can just look it up in your own time. So that's successfully installed. If we go over to app.js, you come down here to Swagger. You just want to set it to true. And then once that's done, all we have to do is just go to our URL. So if you go back up to the top and go overview, you got URL on the side here. This is our URL to our um, mobile service instance. If you go back to your Xamarin Studio or Xamarin project, you'll see this exact same URL. So if you click on it, I'll open up. This is mobile app, oh, this mobile app is running. If you click try it out, 
I'll take you to Swagger, and you should see your tables and any APIs you may have. So we got this, so we can see our to-do item table. If we actually click on that, it'll show us how to make a get request, post, delete, um, and then do individual stuff as well. So we click get and scroll down and give us like a little, so it's all documented for us, we don't actually have to do anything. So it gives us like an example um, response that we may get. Uh, if we come down here, we can actually add in like different filters, different parameters, and then um, just click try it out. And what it will do is it will give us a curl command, so we can put this in, same sort of thing. Here's the URL that we can use inside any sort of application or whatever. So you got your mobile, you know, the URL to your mobile instance, then you got tables and then the table name. And then yeah, here's the response that we get. And yeah, we can do the same for posts. We can actually edit, we can um, insert data. Instead of going through our phone, we can just do it directly from Swagger. And yeah, it's pretty, pretty nice, pretty handy. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Cool. Any questions? No? All good? Firm time. <laughs>All right, thanks, Jason. Um, I hope you all, I hope all of you had fun and kind of followed along. Who kind of got to this step in the end? Uh, not the swagger part, but the overall completion. Oh, fantastic, great. How many of you are nearly there? Nice. Most of you, okay, cool. Um, so what, I, what we will do is, um, we, as soon as we get the lecture recording from the university, um, we will try and post it up. Um, hopefully this works.